Hello, this is Sean Regenbaum bringing you a special episode of the podcast in conjunction with The Pioneer, a student group dedicated to sharing the latest in the world of BME and science at large. Today, I am so excited to have Dr. Carrie Clifford on the podcast. Dr. Clifford is a tenure professor in the joint GT Emory BME program and, more importantly, is the chair of biomedical informatics at MD. His story starts in the kingdom of Queen Elizabeth within the humble world of physics, yet ends in Atlanta, Georgia in the exciting world that lies between data science and biology. He is most well known for his research in signal processing, yet perhaps of even greater interest is his leadership and advocacy towards accessible and open source data and software, a problem that is far too often overlooked in the world of biology today. Without further ado, let's get into the conversation. So you started off in Exeter in, uh, in London or in England. Um, and how was that experience? You uh, started off in research but, and physics, but did you know what you wanted to do back then at all? No, I, I don't think so. I think I just had a, a general interest in, um, in um, the, uh, how the universe works. I, I think um, th there's a quote that I think is attributed to Einstein that was on the wall of our physics department in Southampton, which said, um, I'm not interested in the um, color of this element or the, the weight of this element, but uh, rather I want to know what restrictions God imposed upon the universe when he created it. Right. And I think that's a, that's a great way of describing, um, you know, the thirst for knowledge. It's, um, it, you know, you, you do need all these details, but uh, physics is a, an area where you, you try and take this enormous big picture. But it's funny, I, I actually went to study law there. So I, I got accepted to do law. And uh, by the time I got there, I thought, nah, I don't know if I want to read and memorize a lot of books. And so I, I switched to physics on the first day. I don't think they quite believed that I wanted to do the switch. Most people go the other way. Right. But I, I don't think there's that much difference between law and physics. You know, you come up with a set of... Um, uh, restrictions that you think are somehow um, fundamental to um, the universe or humanity, and then you you test them. And if no one manages to break them down, and then they become precedents, and they stand for a long period of time, but eventually somebody replaces them with something else that is uh, a little bit more accurate uh, or works better for society. Mm -hmm. so there's a, a lot of similarities there. Exactly, but did you have any experience with physics to go from law to physics out of out of nowhere? Or um... well, so so I I had taken we do um, in the UK in high school we uh, from the age of sixteen onwards we concentrate our subjects very highly and I took three subjects um, mathematics, physics, and economics. And in the economics, we studied a lot of law, and I found it fascinating. The you know I, I like to argue. I think um, so. As a scientist, that's good, and as a lawyer, that's good. You know, you're always arguing your points and telling people that, um, or trying to convince people of your um, your belief, if you like, um, based upon the evidence that you're presenting. They're very, very similar in that way. And so, law attracted me in that sense. Um, but you know, the the reality of the studying for it and what it would mean as a job didn't attract me as much as um, as physics, not that, you know, a job in physics, I had any idea what a job in physics would right. be, but I just found the material that much more interesting in that in some way it reflects um, an external reality or at least one that's um, uh, a little less arbitrary and is, um, is something that we can draw out of um, our environment. Uh, to some extent, although of course our language does impose frameworks around that. Did the talking about language? Did the the, the math, the intense math in the, in the curriculum, kind of blindside you or surprise you at all, or is that what you were expecting going in? I actually, uh, I did a very rigorous um, uh, mathematics and uh, physics O levels. They were called Nuffield O levels, and um, they were. Uh, sorry, A levels, and they were um, they set me up so that actually my first year of university was a breeze. I didn't find anything challenging at all because I had such good math teachers uh, all the way through my education. I think that's probably one of the right from the the very beginnings of um, my father drilling my times tables into my head till I could do my thirteen times tables, and and then 
Um, he would always take it a little too far. And then my, you know, I had a series, I was just very lucky. I, you know, I can't say all the teachers I had were, were that good. And I had a very average state school experience in the UK, but um, I was lucky in that my, my mathematics teachers were exceptionally good at teaching and they were always tuned exactly to the right level. So they would be able to teach exactly that level. And then, um, you know, later on looking back, you would say, okay, I, I'm now a better mathematician than they were. Um, you would hope so because they're teaching mathematics, at, you know, to elementary and middle school and high school students. You would hope that you progress beyond that. Mm-hmm. And so um, I, I was just very lucky and I, I was prepared for university by the end, you know, a year before I left. Um, I think my other formative experience in high school was um, I, um, I ended up, um, my physics teacher, who was extremely good at physics but wasn't very good at teaching it, um, was, um, were, were, I, it wasn't really gelling with me as, a, um, as an educational experience, let's put it that way. And I managed to petition and argue that I should just go and sit in the library and teach myself my own physics. Um, a level and um, myself and one other student um, went and did that and we would we taught ourselves our own A levels for mm-hmm. physics. And that's actually where that was a genesis of my interest in it because um, it um, having to do it yourself really, you know, that pushes the boundary so much further. Mm-hmm. You're not just ingesting it, you're going out and searching for it and diving into it. Mm-hmm. But I I um I was also lucky in that my uh, my brother was always, he's an astrophysicist and he was always, he's a year older than me. And he was always into um, anything to do with physics before I was. And so for me, I just absorbed this through my life and I didn't have to go out and look for physics. You know, your environment dictates a lot of things. I remember him um, getting me to sit down and watch Carl Sagan's The Cosmos when it came out. Um, or it may have been a rerun, um, but it was, you know, back in the 70s or 80s. And um, that that was a profound impact on my um, my psyche and interest in um, discovering the world around me. And then, you know, later on, seeing things by reading books by Richard Feynman and um, and other people like him from those, can't help but be fasc- fascinated by the subject. From those experiences, like, so personally, I, when I was in high school, I was in a very similar situation where I, I, there was, there was no physics class actually available at my high school. And so I took it at Georgia State. Um, but that, like, self-motivation was the thing that got me interested because I was the one that wanted to do it. Do you think that idea of, like, self-interest is the thing that carried you on throughout the rest of your academic career? Like, you wanted to do what interested you? Yeah. I mean, I, I think I've always been, um, uh, uh, remarkably short-sighted in that sense uh, of living, living for, you know, I can't, I, I've done a lot of um, jobs here and there where they've been soul destroying, not because I was, you know, um, uh, doing anything nefarious, but uh, because, you know, there was no point to your existence or it felt like there wasn't. And, um, and so I've been very lucky to, have gone out and um, and pursued a career in areas that I found interesting. I've never thought, oh, I'd like a career in this. I've always thought, what would be most interesting for me to think about on a daily basis right. and what would be most rewarding? And that's what's driven me. And right. I, I can't put it down to I, – I think the, the taking control of my own education um, was, you know, partly – personality partly environment and partly circumstance you know it's it's hard to pin down that that was was key i think it's just one thing in a line i think the the main thing i can pin down is the series of mentors that i had at different stages so i I had a high school math teacher who was exceptional in fact i i had a i had a series i I remember um i'm trying to remember it was mr clayton in middle school mr sherrett in high school and then um and then uh in at um uh university it was um i I had this exceptional tutor who actually um 
I, for some reason, I thought, oh, he must have, uh, just a couple, last week, I thought, I'm going to look him up and see what he's doing. Because um, this this guy, his name's Roy Sambles, and he had such a profound effect on my career um, in my undergraduate. Um, it was sort of a pivotal moment for me where I realized that I could go on. Sorry? A physics tutor? Yeah, he was my he was my physics tutor. So we we have this tutorial system in some universities in the UK where there'd just be two, three, four of you right. in a, a room, and you would sit down and go through, you know, just discuss problems once a week. And um, he was he was really exceptional in that um, he could you could walk in there and ask him a question. You know, one time I walked in and said, you know. Um, do you think time is quantized? You know, everything else that we talk about in um, in physics is quantized. And, you know, he went through all the evidence base for and against it with me. And, you know, this is pre, right. far pre-Google. And it was really pre-internet. I remember having an email address, but, you know, there was nothing to right. Google. You could just you could just log on to CERN's website and look at a couple of preprints, and that's about right. it. But, you know, searching through it was difficult. But he would pull a book off a shelf on fold it out, start writing some mathematics on the blackboard. Right. And he would uh, derive the equations, get to the end and go, yes, that's it. And then he would work right. his way back up and explain it all to me. And yes. it was it was profound in its um, – it, it was just a profound experience of seeing how um, somebody who was truly brilliant discovered knowledge. Right. And I he – um, Say again? How to tackle questions, you know, and then yeah, no yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, and it was um, it was just inspiring to see somebody somebody do that in the flesh. And I and then in in my second, he turned around to me and said, "Have you ever thought about doing a PhD?" And I kind of laughed because I um, I, I really was spending all my time reading books that were nothing to do with the curriculum. They were you know focused on philosophy and physics, you know. Reading some incredible books by David Bohm and Richard Feynman and others, but right. um, but I I wasn't doing anything on my my courses except his um, his uh, lectures on optics, which you mm. know he was like he was like seeing Richard Feynman give a lecture. He was wow. really that inspiring, <laughs> and and he said, "Oh yeah, I know I know you're not doing anything but coming to my lectures and tutorials." And I said, yeah. "Well, why would why would you think I could do a PhD then?" And he went, oh, that's simple. You ask the right questions in the lectures. Oh, and that, that was that was a question. pivotal moment for me. I realized that you did, it wasn't what you knew, but what you um, what the way that you asked, um, what is the right answer here, and how do you discover it? Not, and and then the obviously there's a process behind that as well. But I think he, he saw that kernel, and mm -hmm. um, and so I looked him up. Um, and, and we had a little email exchange last week. I, I looked him up and said, oh, I, uh, I was just checking to see you'd, if you'd retired because every time I made a career <laughs> move, I, I would email him, and I, I, I saw that he, you know, he's in his 70s now. He still hasn't retired, and he's built up. He's still at Exeter University. He's built up this incredible um, department that has grown from, uh, you know, uh, over 500 students and 50 faculty, and wow. um, and he just been knighted by the Queen. He was in the new, oh. new so he's Sir Sir Roy Sambles now, and I and I just thought that's fantastic. You know, he's just you could so see that, on. you know, and he's won all these different awards all right. through his life. You know, this is sort of the capstone on the top of it. But it was so nice to you know go full loop right. and you know let him know where I was, and you know every time I'd moved, mm. I'd I'd given him an update. So, yeah, more important than the right answer is the right question. But so going yeah, on and, to uh, and the right and the right mentor, <laughs> the right mentor for sure. I think that's so. It. You went from Exeter to Southampton, um, where you did some theoretical physics. But uh, after that, you went into a PhD in uh, in uh, biomedical engineering and neural networks. And so it's quite a jump to go from the physics world to the bio world. And so, what kind of inspired that change? That's a good question. I. Um, you know, it's just this continual thirst of, for knowledge, just reading around things. And actually, while I was doing uh, my master's in theoretical physics and, and um, mathematics, I, um, I became really fascinated by the idea of um, information theory, um, which wasn't on the curriculum. That's my MO here is I always get fascinated by whatever is not in front of me. It's a, 
uh, <laughs> an affliction in some ways. No I, yeah, I, and so, but I started reading around it and I realized that um, you, you could, there was a parallel between um, information theory and, um, and quantum field theory. And you could treat particles as um, bits of information flowing down a channel. And there's actually um, a correspondence between the two, between inf uh, Shannon's information theory and quantum field theory mm -hmm. in something called um, Zamologikov C theorem. And right. so I did my, my thesis, I did my master's thesis around that. And, um, and then I thought, well, you know, where am I going with this? You know, I'm, I'm not going to become a theoretical physicist, I don't think, because I, I need a more immediate reward. I was looking around and thinking, um, we're not going to um, learn, um, we're not going to discover um, gravitational waves in the near future, and um, <laughs> no one's going to unify um, quantum field theory and gravity very soon. And, and I thought, I, I don't, I'm not sure I can wait um, 20 or 40 years to see something change in my field. I want to see something. Um, something more immediate. So I went to, um, you know, I did a couple of interim jobs, um, taught myself C coding, and then went, um, I emailed a professor in um, Oxford who was the only person um, that I could find um, through my pre-Google search that was, uh, that was doing research in neural networks and, um, and machine learning. Really? No one called it machine learning at the time. And you know, we started an email conversation, and he invited me over to to visit the lab, and we got on straight away, and we saw a really good fit. And actually, the the fit turned out to be around nonlinear dynamics, which I'd studied on my theoretical physics masters, and and so that was sort of the starting point. But um, it was really learning about. I was fascinated with the idea of um, something that could teach itself. Uh, you know, some software, some um, artificial life. It may have even been um, the screensaver on the Sun Unix workstations that we had at the time. It was Conway's Game of Life. I don't know if yeah, you, yeah. you know that, but course, you know, for, for anybody listening who, uh, who doesn't know what it is, you, it's a very simple game where you put pixels on a screen and, um, you know, if, it's, if you're surrounded by pixels, you die. And if you've got enough pixels near you, uh, so you suffocate. If you've got enough near you, then you breed. And it turns out that if you put these randomly around the screen and, you know, you set your parameters right, you end up with something that seems to beat and live and have sort of limit cycles to it. And it seems almost organic. And you think, how, you know, how do you get something? The principle being that if you have a very, a very specific couple set of rules, you can create very intricate patterns. And Exactly. Yeah, yeah. From, uh, from simplicity can uh, emerge complexity. And yeah. so... You know, and I, I've been reading all these books about, you know, the Newtonian Casino and Doyne Farmer and all this great stuff at the Santa Fe Institute in the 60s. Right. And, um, but it was really sort of, you know, the idea of turning this into um, uh, artificial, um, artificial learning algorithms that fascinated me. Right. I really, um, I really wanted to learn more about that. And so, I, you know, I went um, to study, um, neural networks and apply it to something. Um, okay. And it just happened to be that it was biomedical um, engineering that it was applied to. So, you know, that's how I sort of ended up in biomedical engineering and biomedical informatics. It was a pure accident in that sense. <laughs> so it's very interesting uh, that you say it was pure accident because over the past couple of decades, there, there's been a very major trend of physicists going from physics to biology. Um, and um, throughout like yeah. my own thinking, there's been two main reasons, which is one, which you mentioned, physics kind of seems too small at times. The big questions, they're not so many anymore, um, like the massive ones. And, uh, you know, you keep on getting put into smaller and smaller corners while biology kind of seems like this, this massive uh, landscape possibility. And so you didn't know about that, like massive landscape before jumping in. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not the first to, <laughs> to move in that direction, though. You know, physicists have been doing that for for over a hundred years. In fact, hundreds of years. You know, they um, early physicists were looking at electricity moving around the human body. Um, and, you know, right. that's where the electrocardiogram comes from. But in fact, electricity was first identified in organic um, 
living beings before we sort of came up with an idea that it was, um, you know, this natural phenomenon that existed um, all around. We, we, you know, we hadn't, um, we hadn't connected it to lightning and static electricity and certainly not to magnetism for a long, long time. But I don't know whether, um, you know, physicists might argue it's a principle of least action. You know, there's a gradient from physics down to biology in, right. in that, um, uh, you know, too many physicists in too little money <laughs> exactly. with too few, too few problems to lots of problems, lots of money um, and a bigger space. So you could think of it as a diffusion gradient, if you like. But right. um, I, I think it's also... Uh, yeah, you, you're always looking for an area where there's um, there's uh, some some new area or essentially explorers. I think when I was a kid, I always wanted to be I wanted to live in um, the uh, the um, you know the 15 or 1600s before <laughs> um, most of the planet had. Um, Right. contact it been contacted and you know go on these voyages of discovery and um you know i it's uh it's painted now through um a terrible lens and you know horrible things happen but it was right. this idea this romantic notion when i was a kid of just discovering new worlds and right. um and i i think you know the uh outside of and of course everybody wants to be an astronaut but Outside right. of space travel, you know, there's not, you know, and the odds of becoming an astronaut, um, an astronaut are astronomically low. So um, I, I think exploring the mind actually is is a more exciting phenomenon. Exploring um, biology is part of that. Right. right. So, so when you were chose, you know, going from neural networks and applying it to biomedical engineering, what were some of the early problems you worked on uh, that caught your interest? Well, there, you know, uh, when you start a PhD, it's it's whatever your supervisor's interests are, um, and quite rightly so, because you know they they've got a deeper understanding of what the problems are, and um, and so the the first two things I had to do on my PhD were um, one, build a patient monitor which had a pulse oximeter, an ECG, a respiration monitor, temperature, um, and oh. um, yeah, it was, it was pretty much everything laid out on an old ISA card and stuck into the back of a laptop, and we built right. a bunch of these. So I learned very early on, um, this, and this was just within the span of 12 months, how to design, fabricate, and test to industry standards something that could be put on a patient. So I think that was my biggest learning curve. And at the same time, I was simultaneously programming neural networks from scratch in C. And um, in fact, the only libraries I used were numerical recipes in C, which, <laughs> you know, they have Fourier transforms in them and right. sorting oh, algorithms. No, 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 you know, it, it always la makes me laugh nowadays when people are, are coding with, uh, you know, vast libraries of other people's code. And you, you look back and you think, wow, you know, I had to yeah. code my um, activation functions by hand. You probably understand libraries a lot better than the people who use them. <laughs> Yeah, I think you know it's a different different level of understanding. It made me think very, very carefully about uh, small changes in activation functions and why they exist. And um, it, it was a great learning experience. And at the same time, I was still digging through the mathematics of it. So right. rederiving. I, the, <laughs> I remember my um, my tutor, my professor uh, Lionel Tarasenko, asking me very early on to go and design a filter. Um, first filter I'd ever designed. Um, digital filter to uh, bandpass an ECG, get rid of the low frequency noise and the high frequency noise. And so I didn't, I didn't know how to design one. So I went away and looked it up and I looked at, you know, how you would design a filter. And I started, I spent yeah, a couple of days writing out, deriving all the coefficients for it and went back with this lab book, presented it to him. <laughs> and he, he looked at me and he, and he went, why didn't you just use SP tool in MATLAB? And, <laughs> and I, I looked at him and went, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, and um, and that's when I mo started moving from C to MATLAB because I, I found these, you know, higher level languages right. had uh, lots of useful tools built into them. And, you know, it was a five to 20 minute design job versus, um, you know, but I learned a lot about, you know, where the fil you know, filter coefficients and what they mm -hmm. mean. And, 
So your so, your jump from uh, you know where you were to hardware it was kind of in conjunction with your jump from uh, you know lower level languages to MATLAB. Oh yeah, the um, the <laughs> I, I think the first year of my PhD was just um, you know it was drinking from ten fire hoses simultaneously. I you know I I, I would go down to um, Oxford Instruments were um, funding this medical monitor that I was building and. Um, and I would go down one day a week there and um, go and scavenge hardware out of um, their offices and, and um, reprogram them in assembler. <laughs> and so I was I was working on assembler with C, cross compiling it. I mean, uh, and that would be one day a week. And then you know, a couple of days a week I'd be building this hardware. And a couple of days a week I'd be programming your networks in C. It was in the world. It was, of hardware uh, didn't scare you away. Uh, well, I'd done a little bit of hardware before. Um, and, um, on my physics, cause my physics degree was with electronics. So I'd done a little bit of electronics there. So I, I, I had no fear of electronics. I'd done circuit theory and, um, I felt confident about it. Although I learned very quickly that electronics is much more, it has some black art to it as well. <laughs> I was, um, I was working with, um, uh, just before I went to, um, university uh, to do my PhD, I took a year off, um, or I shouldn't say a year off. I I uh, decided to do some crazy things for a year, and I went traveling around the Middle East. And then um, I worked uh, freelance for a friend who made audio equipment um, from a converted cow shed in the middle of um, a village in Wiltshire. Where all hardware and, fascination starts. Yeah, and he, exactly. And I learned a lot about. Um, I'm you know I, I I like to play instruments, and uh, I still got my old audio equipment from the 1980s and old NAD and um and so you know purity of sound is is uh, really fascinating to me and we would uh we would sp spend days programming actually we were working on this non-contact musical instrument for um uh kids with disabilities and it was a uh, an ultrasonic interface to a MIDI instrument it was very cool and this this engineer that I was working with he was just brilliant 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 guy and um he um he uh would he would fi fix theremins for Portis Head, which is a well known band that made them at the yeah. time and all, all sorts of stuff. And it was it was a really weird and fascinating world to be in. But speaking of speakers, by the way, this is my latest uh contraption, an omnidirectional speaker that I use for um, my audio so that I'm hearing you through. Oh nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So yeah, I'm um it's a dangerous path. <laughs> it, it's a dangerous path to go down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You might want to ask your, uh, might not want to tell your supervisor you're spending exactly. time working on that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. So anyway, I would take I would take my second designs back to um, to this guy, and we would chat about them. Um, and he, sometimes he'd be looking at it and he'd go, "You need a forty nine uh, nanofarad capacitor here, just across the between this this." Um, yeah. This joint and and the um and the um your earth and I'd I'd be like why he'd be like oh stray capacitance <laughs> and, you know I go back and sit down with my professor and go okay well you know just having a chat with a friend and he's just and they'd be like yeah oh, that's a good idea yeah and I'm like what, what is this like <laughs> there's a theory on the paper and then uh, you know when you come when it comes to electronics there's um you know these are high wizards of the uh the world of electronics so uh, that's a uh, I, I learned a lot about that and i learned what i do know and what i don't know and and who to talk mm -hmm. to and um and you know i learned a lot about data representation and how things can go wrong and i think that was partly where you know informatics came into it you know it sort of drove my my desire to learn more about you know you can you can make your representation of your data slightly wrong and it ruins everything. Right. So in, in regards to that, right, your, some of your most famous work is uh, within ECG data, um, but you deal with pretty much all the signals that uh, you can probably gather from the body. And so when it comes to that type of thinking, like it makes sense as how you got from where you were to what you're doing today, because you've been fiddling with these types of signals from the beginning. Um, but what kind of holds your interest about it? Meaning, What's so fascinating about a oscillating thing going up and down? What is fascinating about it? Well, first of all, um, if it's not oscillating correctly, you die. So it's <laughs> that that's fairly fascinating. You know, having um, having the ability to to look at something um, and 
and tell something about somebody's current health status very, very rapidly is is really important. Um, it's something that you know you feel a little bit more empowered by. I think we all feel um, uh, extremely impotent in the presence of uh, doctors whenever, because you know it's usually you're sitting there and you've got something wrong with you, and um, you know there's you don't even know where to start to dig up the information. You can do all sorts of self-diagnosis, but um, again, there's almost an art to putting together. Uh, you know, there's very much science right. drives it, but um, but there's a lot of art in medicine that, that pretty much like the that point. But yeah, but it, yeah, it's it's very similar to you know, cir it. circuit design in that sense. But there's um, but even more complex. It, but there's also, you know, I, I was sitting, um, I remember um, I've been doing some work with a company called LifeCore for a few years now, and they um, they uh, build these um, really nice uh, handheld ECG devices. Um, and I was just sitting around one day with my uncle in uh, a cafe in London. I'd uh, gone back on a visit and he was complaining that he's, Apple Watch kept telling him his heart rate was um, doubling periodically. And I said, oh, it's probably just, you know, um, picking up um, some double oscillation. And you know, there's, a, there's often some, they call it dichrotic notch, but it's it's some reflection wave going on in, in the pulse. And uh, I said, you know, it could be that. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I just felt his pulse um, and realized that it was actually really fast. You know, sometimes the uh, the simplest observations are the, are the easiest, um, yeah. and and so I I got out one of these ECG devices that I was carrying around with me, and I just gave it to him to hold, and I looked at it, and I went, well, it doesn't look normal. You know, I don't want to diagnose you because I'm not a a clinician, but there's definitely something wrong there, especially the fact that your heart is suddenly going from you know 60 beats a minute to 120, and or no, I think it was like. 80 to 160 or something and um and i said you know you, you need to go and um get this looked at and his his kids my cousins looked at him and said see dad i told you no one listens to their kids and so um you know he went the next day and you know sure enough he he had got some ventricular problem and had to have it ablated and you feel very empowered to be able to do that you know i think that's the direction that the kind of technology that we're working on is moving in and um you know there's a danger to that as well because People will overdiagnose themselves. You have to know what you're doing, and you have to be able to use the information correctly. But we are going in that direction um, of empowering everyone to be able to use devices, um, low-cost devices, to uh, to do these kind of diagnostics and uh, improve outcomes for ourselves. So I I think that really excites me. You know, that's so. If you want to know why, you know, just a simple. Uh, one-dimensional signal oscillating through time is interesting, uh, you know, because it, it can also be extremely complex. You can make it yeah. multidimensional. When you think about it, it's, um, it's actually a three-dimensional object that's squeezing, rotating, and translating through space and ejecting blood out, out of it. It's a very dynamic object. And as a physicist, I like to see how simple can I make a representation of that <laughs> and still capture all of the information. You know, so that that's uh, that's where that model came from. And yeah. in fact, you know, even though it's probably my it is my most highly cited work, it, it's funny. It was um, it was just a game that myself and Patrick Mischeria, um, another mathematical a, a mathematician that I was working with in Oxford, we decided to do for fun one summer. And my supervisor actually said, "Don't bother. It's a waste of your time." <laughs> and um, and he he was right in that. Uh, philosophically, it was a waste of time because we were just doing something for fun. But yet, it sort of spurned its own industry of of, of research for me. So, um, in that sense, um, nothing you know, there's nothing, be. nothing. You, there's nothing to be learned there except that sometimes doing something fun that you've been told not to do can lead <laughs> to very useful things. Uh, exactly, it's very similar with uh, Newton, right? He he didn't want it. He wasn't. Aiming to make calculus at first, but uh, he took off some time off, and that's what happened. 
Yeah, it, it's exactly like Newton. Me and Newton were, you know, we're yeah. in history books. You know, they <laughs> now probably won't be able to tell us apart. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I don't think I would make quite that comparison. But um, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about the comparison with um, how they discovered the background microwave radiation for mm-hmm. from the Big Bang, and um, that's a uh, that's a ridiculous comparison to make as well. But I still love the story of. Um, you know, you have these engineers who are um, working on, they're actually trying to transmit a signal from uh, Bell Labs in New Jersey to, um, I think it was Caltech in yeah. California, and bounce it off a big high altitude silver weather balloon. And um, and they had too much noise in it, and they kept thinking it was pigeon shit in the antenna. Mm-hmm. And they kept going in there and trying to clean it out. And eventually mm-hmm. one of them was on a flight somewhere sitting next to a theoretical physicist we said, oh, well, maybe it's the background microwave radiation. And sure enough, um, you know, uh-huh. that's, what it t- that's what it turned out to be. And, they, you know, they won their Nobel Prize for that. And um, a, a few years ago, I, I, I got invited up to Bell Labs and um, I was walking around their courtyard and there's a plaque to Penzias and Wilson, these guys who discovered the, um, the background microwave radiation um, kind of by accident. Right. And it was it's right in the middle of their courtyard, right in the middle of Bell Labs, and it's beautiful. I got a photograph of it, which is this beautiful plaque talking about their their discovery. And sure enough, on top of it, there's a pigeon is shat on it. It was perfect. <laughs> and I don't think they placed that there. It just happened to be, you know, serendipitous. Uh, the t- uh, the were... subtitle should have been uh it turns out their discovery wasn't pigeon shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not a yeah. shit discovery, yeah. Exactly. I'm not sure if this exactly. is uh... a <clears throat> And so another big, mm-hmm. another big focus of yours is, uh, you know, making accessible data and software for the research world. And so personally, I've done a lot of bioinformatics and truthfully also in the hardware world, but where the pipelines and the, and the processes and the methods are completely or almost unreadable. You know, you see there's six languages involved. You take this and go from C to R to MATLAB and back and forth. And it's not very well documented. And so what kind of inspired you to even think about like saying this is a problem and going on to solve it because usually the the cs world the math world they keep with their code and doing whatever they want and the biologists they stick with what they're doing and they don't mix yeah again i i think it's probably a combination of you know um the my serendipitous upbringing of you know ending up in physics and wanting things to be repeatable mm. and understandable so that that's key to all physics is um you know if, if you can't repeat it over and over and over again and get the same result then it's not science and that's completely lacking in pretty much all code bases um distributed out there on the internet at the moment most stuff out there is pretty much garbage yeah. in that sense um and then also serendipitously um, meeting the right mentors. And um, and I was very lucky to, uh, early on in um, my PhD, I, I was struggling to get data because I had to build the equipment to capture it myself. So um, a, uh, a colleague and a friend, James Party, suggested I look at the MIT BIH Arrhythmia database, which was available via tape from... Um, mail order from MIT from a guy called George wow. Moody and um, who was working for Roger Mark in uh, the laboratory for computational physiology up at MIT. And you could, uh, you know, suddenly the CD came out. I was so lucky that year. And they <laughs> mailed us a CD the with, a, yeah, with all this data on it. And, um, and that's how I got to know uh, the PhysioNet team. And then um, actually um, my... I met my um, to-be wife at Oxford while we were graduate students, and she accepted a position in Boston, um, and I decided, yeah, well, let's move there. So we got married, and um, I, uh, I was moving to Boston, and I bumped into, a year before I moved, I bumped into um, Roger Mark and his team at a conference and <laughs> mentioned that I would be in Boston that week. Um, and they invited me to give a talk and, um, you know, we got, got yeah. chatting and they offered me a position, a postdoc there. And, uh, you know, I then spent the next seven years um, building reusable databases and um, doing research on them um, for Roger Mark. And yeah. he became, you know, not just a mentor, but, a, you know, a, 
uh, a, uh, an extra grandfather to me. <laughs> and so I had this wonderful mentor that, um, who, and, I, and in his lab, you know, open source um, software and open access um, yeah. database was, you know, not just a, a philosophy, but, you know, living, breathing, um, day-to-day existence there. And so that with, you know, working with George Moody, he's a brilliant physicist, actually, who ended up in this area too. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I, uh, I just embodied, um, the, the zeitgeist, I think, and, Right. Took it on board. I think it, you know, it's it seemed entirely obvious to me. It wasn't a coincidence as well that you know, Richard Stallman was in the next building over and would occasionally send me emails to to criticize my choice of open source license and that kind of <laughs> stuff. It was a very strange place. You know, you could go to a lecture by Marvin Minsky and a dinner with Noam Chomsky, and then um, and then uh, you know, end up getting told off by Richard Stallman at the end of the day. It was it's a very 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 weird place, but it was great in that sense. And, you know, you're always sort of this tiny minnow that uh, right. was just absorbing information. Uh, it was great. So taking that, like, philosophy of, you know, open source, open access, everything, what do you think kind of the the solution is to, the, you know, the, just the massive amount of unreadable code there is out there? Do you think it lies in giving the tools to, like, hard researchers, or does it lie in teaching the skills of how to document and how to even write good code to uh undergraduates and uh and such yeah it it's uh it's like solutions to everything it's it's a bit of many things um i think certainly um the way we teach coding and documentation is is pretty poor and we just kind of uh, let mentors do that in a fairly ad hoc way, and it's it's pretty bad. Um, you know, when I set courses, I I um I I'm just wrapping up a, a course at the moment on informatics, and I'm grading mostly people on how readable their code is, and um you know the structure of their code and how they've named their variables, and you know people are still sending me um, uh, descriptions of code with the title of their their um, their document is called untitled you know it's it's still frightening how bad people are and sloppy people are at this stuff and i i actually think you know the the other side to that you have to get in early and teach people how to do this properly and give them the skill set to be able to communicate it's the same as can you speak the language in in which you're trying to express the the concepts fluently and i mean the scientific language so it's it's part of that Right. And it's can you write a, a, a scientific article properly? It's all part of the documentation process. But actually, um, for the last five or so years, I've been running the Physionet Challenges, which are these um, annual competitions that George Moody and Roger Mark started back in 2000, where they would take a data set that they had curated, maybe some new data, and they would um, put it up publicly and have people compete to try and... Um, try and produce the best algorithm to solve whatever problem it is, you know, detection of sleep apnea, prediction of um, AF, um, detection of sepsis, detection of arousals. You know, there's all sorts of great ideas, uh, unsolved ideas in um, physiological um, signal processing and machine learning or, or medicine to, to set. Um, but we've evolved it over the last few years to say, okay, um, First of all, we're going to have a hidden data set that no one ever sees, and you don't get to download that. And you have to send us your code, and we'll run it against it. For validation. But, yeah, so, so for validation. Um, but on top of that, you also have to give us the, the training code. So you have to give us the entire harness so that we can reproduce the training for that as well. And, and that's almost entirely missing out there, You know, the nuances of how somebody put together the training uh, to reproduce what they've um the entire pipeline we don't enforce any coding standards on that at this point because um it's hard enough to get people to uh to even um even submit open source code um and well i wouldn't say it's hard to get people to do it. it's i'd rather they spend all their time getting the the um algorithm as um uh, as best performing as possible and you know the documentation can happen later Right. Um, but I think that's that's another part of it is having this these 
um, like for like in the literature. So you, you you see a lot of articles published out there where you know famous person A um, gets data set B and publishes a massive article in Nature um, and doesn't bother to compare their approach to anybody else. Um, and and that's it. And you know, if you ask them for their data, they go, "Well, I'm sorry, I, you know, I'm not allowed to share it." And if you ask them for their code, it doesn't actually produce the results that you see. Right. Um, and and so having this these competitions or these challenges where people um, go head to head on the same data sets, and they don't get to cheat by um, working out what the distribution of the data is in the in this hidden data. You know, people in machine learning will complain about that and say, oh, well, you know, it has to match perfectly my training data. And you go, well, that's not the real world. The right, future, you know, the, the, the distribution of data, data in the future from now doesn't match today. Exactly. So that's a problem you've, that you've got to solve. You've got to, you're, you're, um, you're trying to work out um, how do I use today's data to solve a problem in a future for a population that's evolved and changed, exactly. which is very different to physics. In physics, we pretend that the laws of nature or assume that the laws of nature are the same everywhere in all directions and they don't change with time. Um, although, you know, people have started to talk about how that it might not necessarily be true, but at least it happens on astronomical time periods. Whereas for humans, um, you know, all the data that we had in hosp the hospital in 2019 isn't really very useful in 2020 for making predictions because of the density of COVID-19 patients in our hospitals. Yeah. And you can, you can get these, you know, pivotal changes in your population. And you have to ask the question, well, how do you deal with that? And there's some very clever approaches to being able to do that, that we challenge people to try and implement. Right. But you can't know what's going to work beforehand. No, but you can you can come up way, with ways of saying, okay, can I quantify what's different about my future data that um, that can be um, so you know you get a new person coming in and you say how different is that to my my training data, right. and then what could I do based upon that difference? How would I how would my code um, or my predictor build that difference in to make a something work better on future unseen data? Right. It's, uh, you know, the, the old paradigm that um, machine learning is good at interpolating, but very bad at extrapolating. Right. <laughs> Getting the code to the data. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, to extrapolate, you need a model. I mean, right. a real model, not a, <laughs> yeah. a data-driven model. Exactly. And so this is something. So I personally worked on a, a sleep apnea device where, you know, you have SCG data, ECG data, SPO2 data, and you use all these things to kind of just try to do some Fourier transfers and, like, separate the signals and say this is from that and that's from this and all, all these different little, little layers but one thing i always kind of thought about was we're kind of stuck with the same signals at the same places right we've determined that you put spo2 on the finger and you put the ecg right over here and there's been a lot of research to say you know maybe we can move the places placements different but there hasn't been a lot of uh recent work on like fundamentally changing the sensors that we use and so do you think that there's kind of a bottleneck or anything like that in terms of the hardware that we we use to gather our data. Well, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't necessarily agree that we haven't changed the um, the sensors. We haven't started to um, to evolve um, our notion of what the sensors should be. You know, we're starting to look at. Um, I mean, people have put accelerometers on the body, and now we're moving more and more to looking at off-body stuff like uh, video cameras for right. uh, we've done some work on sleep apnea detection using video cameras for many years mm -hmm. and uh, looking at whole body movements um, so I think the sensor technology is changing but and then you're starting to see lots and lots of um, uh, epidermal tattoo like sensors right. um, although fundamentally there's not that much difference about the transduction in there um, but, um, I, I think, you know, it's, the question is, you know, what's the, what's the problem you're trying to solve? I, I think saying, oh, let, let's invent a new sensor, um, can be interesting, but it's, uh, you know, a solution looking for a problem, which is okay. Right. If you're, if you're inventing, um, hardware, 
but um, you couldn't necessarily say, um, I'm looking at people's physiology and there's some senses missing. I, I think probably what is missing is um, thinking about what a clinician does in terms of diagnostics. So they look at, um, you know, whether you smell septic or whether you um, look disoriented. Um, so looking at things like speech patterns, eye gaze, head movements, uh, physical locomotion, um, and maybe even, you know, olfactory sensors. All of these things could be uh, additional ways of, of monitoring patients and trying to provide prediction. But you always have to ask the question, to do what? You know, would that help with sleep apnea, for example? Um, probably not because they're, they're asleep. Yeah. But, um, well, most of the time, hopefully. <laughs> so the, the question is, you know, probably movement sensors are the, the single most interesting um, addition, I think, to, to that kind of monitoring. Right. And so kind of wrapping up, uh, in terms of your long-term research goals and uh, impacting society and having practical applications, what, what do you view as your long-term vision in both like public data and software and uh, in interpreting signals? That's a good question. I mean, there's, there's lots, of, uh, lots of things I would like to do and, and think are important. One is um, uh, perhaps the most important is that the hardware um, that we're providing people, um, because there always has to be some kind of transduction of the information at one end. Right. So that is moving more and more towards, you know, AI, edge computing technology that's the price is driving, dropping. And so there's this opportunity for us to be able to capture um, the intelligence and uh, local knowledge of each individual user and then pull that back together in some kind of federated landscape. So I think there's there's something very exciting around that where you can build bespoke tools for um, different um, disparity populations and empower people to move away from this idea of uh, a pyramid scheme of training people um, in sequential layers through a pyramid and then you know the best ones then propagate back up and there's a brain drain. Instead, if we've got a distributed sense of set of sensors around, which are able to provide real-time feedback to the users and train them on the fly and include their knowledge at the same time, then I think that's game-changing. It kind of empowers every individual, every healthcare worker to be part of the diagnostic and, um, and, uh, and uh, group knowledge. Um, at the same time, I think we need to be building these standardized, ever increasingly large standardized databases that um, people um, can train against without actually um, overfitting to them. And that requires us to evolve these databases over time, continually expanding their science. Right. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to meet with me. And I uh, really look forward to speaking again. You're welcome, Sean. Thanks for thanks for inviting me to oh. chat to you.